were making our mark. People were buzzing. You know, they knew we were strong. Again, overall quickest or, or second quickest. And you couldn't ask for more. It was paying off. Reese loved the car. He was having fun. He's now a Porsche believer. We were thrilled. Everything that built and the design of the car was working out. It's what we had planned to do, and we had been achieving all of those goals. Coming into race week, we felt really good, but, you know, again, keeping it humble and modest, anything can happen. I've never really worried about the other competitors. The number one competitor at Pikes Peak is Mother Nature and the mountain itself. So throughout the course of week and practice, we were just making sure we were just staying ahead of the competition comfortably. But we knew if we were running a couple of seconds ahead of the competition per mile, that would give us a 24 second advantage. And that would put us well under the current record in class and potentially break nine minutes. So day one, we start in the middle section. It's where you climb the highest elevation in a single two mile section, about two and a half thousand feet. And that's over a, a section of road that is hard braking, low speed, 180 degree hairpins, and then acceleration points to the next braking point. It's really like a drag race setup as you exit the corner. And then it reverts back to why we went to Horse Thief Mile to develop the low speed mechanical grip out of the car for those hairpin turns. That's when I really first got exposed to why a Porsche works so good and really why it is best suited for this race, maybe over any other car as a rear engine, mid-engine kind of setup. We then move to the top section. You've crested over the, the top of the mountain and now you're running on the Razorback or the ridge line to the summit. You're going from first gear to third gear kind of corner environment to flat out fifth and sixth. This requires a different level of confidence. You really need to trust the car, the setup. It's not about full throttle, it's about full commitment. I've always been quick up there, the balance of the car felt good, and we laid down a really good time on the third run. And from there, we really knew we were gonna be in a good place leading into qualifying on the next day. So day three for us was qualifying. The ground temperatures were 70 degrees, ambient temperatures were warm, and it was a good representation of what race day should be. I took it a little safe on the first two corners, just to feel the medium compound tire again, with all the changes that we had done in the car, with spring balance and power supply and everything. And then after the first two corners, just pushed hard. the qualifying record by another two and a half seconds, I believe it was. And at that point, set a time that was six seconds quicker in qualifying than any Porsche had ever gone and kind of stamped the seal on the fact that this is the fastest Porsche to ever tackle Pikes Peak. At that point, you have the confidence that you have the right balance in the car, you have the right setup and you can trust it. That leads into race day. We were on point to set a new world record break nine minutes and achieve everything that we had spoken about six months prior. You know, we were getting faster and faster. We were having fun. Everyone knew we were flying, and we were. So your enthusiasm grows. It was hard not to get excited, you know, and we were second fastest overall on the hill. We qualified third, but we had that second place car covered up on the rest of the mountain. We were right where we wanted to be. So the unique thing about Pikes Peak, the only thing you don't have control of is you don't control the weather. 
it was really hard not to be really nervous when the weather reports started coming in. Storm set in, you had snow, you had ice, you had rain, you had low fog and visibility, wet track. Pretty much in my history of running the event for 20 plus years, I've never seen conditions like this. And it came in at exactly the wrong time. It sucks the wind out of you. It takes all that adrenaline, all that energy, positive energy that you've experienced from ticking every box, getting everything right, proving that to your competition that what you stated in your press release of what you were going to do and you achieved, and it just knocks you on the ground. Uh, it was hard. It was really hard to be excited anymore. Everyone was disappointed. Every team. At this point, you're competing against Mother Nature. But the race must go on. There's a title to be achieved as the fastest that year. There's no records that are gonna be broken. So as a driver, you have to accept that. As a team, you have to accept that. <laughs> Last minute thoughts. It's kind of a shame we've had such perfect weather um, all of the month of June. We'll just see what happens. Really, the most important thing is that the car makes it up to the top uh, safely uh, for Reese. So with the weather changes, all of that effort, that emotion that you'd put into days, weeks, months of preparation to define this car for a dry race course had all been thrown out the window. of the visibility just went to another level. The fog was so low and was so thick that you were purely just kind of going off a muscle memory instinct. This was probably the closest to reality of closing your eyes and trying to envision the road. It's kind of like losing your senses, your taste, your hearing, your vision. And without that, you just cannot compliantly place the car on the road. That was probably the biggest challenge and the biggest risk. Having to compensate for the weather, we were some two minutes slower than what our target time was in the dry. I wasn't willing to risk anything. I'm gonna drive the car the best of my ability that day and, and hopefully still pull off a win. We did that, we won. We won our class and we got the qualifying record and made our statement to all the officials and other teams. You know, we were, we were strong, we were prepared. <laughs> Seven hours old. Uh, way to hang in there. <laughs> so you do everything right for, for weeks, for months. Um, you hit all your targets. Everything is performing flawlessly. Meticulous details are checked. The weather changes, you get sick. And, well, that's racing. I guess it happens. One of the biggest victories for me, honestly, was turning Reese into a believer and showing him a really, really good time in the car. But when he started talking about driving again next year was probably one of the biggest victories for me. And he meant it. So hopefully we get the opportunity to do it. If this partnership was to continue and we were to go back with this car to the mountain, I already know that this car will break nine minutes quite comfortably. 
what the team as a whole was able to achieve is just remarkable and they now have the eyes of the world on them as the top dogs in a Porsche product. This was such a fun project to do. I hope you guys enjoyed the series. Now we're actually gonna finish it off and we're gonna talk about Pikes Peak as a whole. And of course, we're gonna talk about our good friend, Reese Millen. All right, here we are, last episode of this three-part series. We are at Emotion Engineering. My friend Joey Seeley is here. We're talking about this incredible Porsche GT3R Pikes Peak Special built for the 100th running of Pikes Peak, driven by our good friend, Reese Millen. What a crazy year, huh? What a crazy year. It was, uh, it, I don't even know how to, how to put it into words because it went so perfectly for us. By the time we got there, we were strong and everyone knew it. All through the preliminary tire test, we were the fastest on the hill. And even through race week, we were often fastest until Robin got his car running right. You know, and then we were second quickest on the hill. Everything we had worked for for so long, you know, for years really, but six months of building this car was perfect. We were right where we wanted to be, keeping it modest because you never know what's going to happen. And sure enough, the weather rolled in. It's happened for the past however many races. Why is it that they didn't just run the race during practice? Because for whatever reason, at practice, it's always perfect weather. Yeah, well, this year was exceptional. I've never seen weather like that where all of June was perfect. It was warmer than ever. Like my team, we ran two cars. We were in the 935 as well for Jeff Zwart. Those guys were all rookies and hadn't run. I was like, you guys got to be prepared. Lots of layers, you know, hand warmers, whatever. You know, and up at the summit, it's usually 30 degrees. And then wind or if there's rain or snow, like it, it really throws the challenges at you. This year at the summit section, I was in shorts and a t-shirt halfway through practice. It was ridiculous. I'd never seen anything like it. So every single year when we go to Pikes Week, we're bringing new people. You know, we have to get them winter clothes. Try getting a whole winter outfit in the middle of summertime. It's pretty hard. But on top <laughs> of that, people don't realize I've been the coldest I've ever been in my life in the summertime on top of Pikes Peak. I've seen 25 degree weather in the morning. Yeah, it's absolutely freezing. It's hard for the car because you don't get any temperature into the tires and it's hard for us because your joints are all tight and you're moving slowly and you know, you're know you sucking thin air and you're dizzy and you know, you're hungry. You know, all of it's just, so it's brutal. It being cold is not even the big problem. The big problem for us actually is dealing with the rain, hail, sleet, snow, yeah. all of it, the elements, the sideways rain and the sideways hail to the point where I can't even open my eyes. It's incredible. And unfortunately, during race day, we had a lot of that this That's, year. We had none of it through, for, through practice and then race day was bitter cold and raining. And then of course, the, the, even worse was the, the visibility. Yeah. You know, imagine trying to drive up that mountain uh, with a thousand horsepower car, but not being able to see where you're going. You know, Jeff and Reese both said, in 25 years, I've never experienced anything like that. It was seriously like pea soup thick. Yeah. How did qualifying go for you guys? Qualifying went great. I mean, we were even making changes to the chassis on qualifying day. We ended up breaking the qualifying record for Pikes Peak Open Class by three seconds, I believe and then faster than any other Porsche had ever qualified by about six seconds. So we were thrilled. I mean, again, everything was going off perfectly. You know, exactly how we had uh, anticipated and everything it was working out. The crazy thing to me is that a street car almost won overall. All wheel drive, no aero pretty much at all. But of course, because it was slick, wet, it worked to its advantage. Like right. You could push nine tenths in that car, right. but you couldn't push in this. Right. It would it, just be too dangerous. Exactly. So many people had asked me, they're like, it's pretty sad that a street car beat you. I was like, why? That thing's making about 800 horsepower with all wheel drive and stock suspension that is very soft and compliant. You know, and then of course, modern electronics and street cars are fantastic. You know, you, like everyone in every type of car is, you know, was setting their individual best because the electronics have gotten so good. So on a wet day where you're struggling to put power down and all the electronics are kicking on and you have all wheel drive and street tires, you know, I, I wasn't surprised at all to be completely honest. So weight difference wise, I don't know how much the um, Turbo S weighed, but how much does this weigh? 
we ended up a little heavier than, than we had anticipated, partially because of that oil cooler. When we left the final tests from here, we were about 2,860 pounds, so pretty light, considering mm -hmm. we got to ditch a lot of stuff and added a lot of stuff. So we were only about 60 pounds heavier or 80 pounds heavier than the car stock. We ended up around 3,000 pounds, you know, in race trim. With so, race in it? Uh, no, not with Reese in it. Okay. Um, so we were a little heavier than we wanted to be, but that's still significantly lighter than a Turbo S, you know, Go 992. On. Before we talk about the interior, I just kind of <laughs> wanted to point out a fun little Easter egg on here. Um, tell me about this. <laughs> <laughs> we had a little bit of fun, you know, because we had some very well marketed competition this year. Reese is a competitor through and through, and he sent me a Pac Man and the a Ghost via text. So I sent it to Wade Devers, who, who designed this livery, and he came up with that, which is awesome. And we wanted to run it on the car and on his helmet and uh, for race day, but when, when they didn't show up, uh, we, we felt it wasn't in bad taste to you know, add insult to injury. But now, now is a different story, and we have a little bit of fun and threw the sticker on the this car. This is so cool. <laughs> it's actually sad in a way, I mean, because you guys know I've been shooting with Ken and that whole gang for so many years since Jim Kana 4. And, you know, we had a chance to shoot Climb Kana, which was incredible. Right. You know, it took us 12 days to shoot that, which was crazy. From that, you know, I honestly got probably my most iconic photo of all time, yeah. I think. And since that's happened, you know, the question uh, has always been, hey, when's Ken Block actually going to race Pikes Peak? Unfortunately, the 100th running wasn't to be. Right. But who knows? Maybe later years. Uh, in a Porsche, which is so crazy. Yeah, right? yeah. We were, we were, everyone was excited because any more exposure that that race can get, it, we're all for it because you're passionate about the race. I am. Just about everybody I know that has competed at Pikes Peak is passionate about it. So we were excited to see it happen, bring all the you know, hoopla and excitement. And of course, you know, a lot of people know the, the, the builder of that car is my old you know, best friend and business partner. And, and I was looking forward to competing against him directly. And anybody who knows us was looking forward to the head-to-head -head battle as well. So, you know, that's, that'll be for another year. Mm -hmm. There's so much to unpack in here. Um, it's actually a lot busier than it would be stock. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, as we kind of discussed, we tore this car down completely to a tub and all of the wiring loom was taken away and all the electronics were taken away because obviously, you know, an NA power plant for endurance racing is not going to work for a twin turbo with anti-lag and uh, gear dependent boost and, you know, measuring, uh, you know, uh, air density, all kinds of the stuff that we're doing um, that the car didn't have the electronics for it. So whole new wire loom, all new electronics, you know, all new dash, PDM, and we've already gone over the oil tank, water tank, water pump. So that's, that's where it starts to get busy is all this, all this plumbing everywhere. You know, we've got water plumbing through the car, oil plumbing into the car, um, you know, and the extra, the extra electronics. I could see where you can lose weight right now. <laughs> you can go with a lithium ion battery. You know, that was, that was with my tuner, M Engineering. You know, we, he's had enough issues with electronics and, you know, uh, duty cycle on injectors because of low batteries. Uh, and he's just like, no. And if you saw the car when we were in the pit, we actually plugged in a secondary battery oh. while, he, while he was sitting here and the fans were running. We, we didn't play around when it came to to powering the car because that really can wreak havoc. Got it, yeah. got it. That makes sense. But Try yeah, you're right. That could be a that could be a significant amount of weight uh, lost. So what like what is this? That's the electric power steering pump. So oh. it's an electric electro hydraulic power steering in these cars. So inside that box is a is a electric uh, uh, power steering pump. That's crazy. It's it's so crazy that it's like engine bay but exploded. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, because this is the water pump? That's a water pump. And some people have, who work on BMWs have recognized that. That's a BMW water pump that cools the engine. Oh. So we just use it to, to cycle water through the intercoolers and up to the, uh, up to the heat exchanger and then back into this tank. But there's still a water pump on the engine. Right, because that's a separate system. Tucked away, you got the, you know, we've got the com uh, computers and the PDM is, is up there. Mm -hmm. um, this, is, this is the, uh, the pump 
for the paddle shift because this is a, a paddle shift sequential gearbox with a little computer fan on top of it that keeps the, the pump cool. This there's, is the distribution block. There's just so much going on. Yeah, this is the fire system. Yeah. We swapped out the original seat. Um, Sparco supplied us with this seat uh, and harnesses because uh, again, Reese has a long-standing relationship with them and it's all about, I mean, in any form of racing, it's about making the driver comfortable. Yeah. You know, so getting him in the proper seating position and, and what he wants, I mean, he, this is actually rather high and a lot of the guys at Pikes Peak like it because they want to see over the nose, you mm. know, at the apex going into one of the corners, you know, pointed uphill. And that's saying something, especially because the Porsches probably have the best view, yeah. like a like cockpit view yeah. out of most cars, just because you don't have that crazy long hood. Yeah, right? yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, and they do have a relatively high uh, roof line compared to some other cars, but you know, you see these, you know, the endurance cars and you barely see the visor of the driver, you know, mm. when you look through it. So they're sitting up a, a little bit higher. It's cool. You can actually see a lot of the machining on the intercoolers. Yeah, those end tanks, you know, we, we designed in, in CAD first and then uh, it, it's neat to see the tool path, you know, still like scaling on the uh, on those end tanks. There's just so much going on here. Um, on top of that, you have uh, the air jacks. Uh, the air jacks are um, kind of hidden right yep. by the oil tank over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you see it right there is the front ones. Right. That just so. makes it so much easier to work on. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. the bigger thing, the bigger thing is honestly to um, put the tire warmers on the cars. Mm. Unfortunately, because we have so much droop travel, we weren't able to run the tire warmers on the tires because the tire was too close to the bodywork. We actually had to cut the bodywork away you know, for that. But what we did is having air jacks, we were able to pop the wheels off as soon as Reese got back and put them in the car with the heat on mm. and then keep the other ones in the tire warmers. And we didn't take them out of the tire warmers until it was time for him to run, you know, so that was how we were able to maintain, you know, our, our best case scenario of, of tire temperature. What are we looking at here? A lot of the stuff, um, endurance stuff, I guess doesn't really matter anymore, right? Right, we, we deleted a bunch of it, you know, and even with just like black gaffers tape, and then mm -hmm. some of it we relabeled with a, with a label maker. It's a little sloppy in, in my opinion, but yeah, we got everything we need um, for that race. We still have ABS, you know, we still have traction control. Um, a lot of it is up here too. We have map switching, traction control. Down there was the ABS. You know, this is how he can, you know, funnel through, you know, alarms and, and uh, the display on the dash. Obviously, we don't have a drink. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, <laughs> Reece, could you imagine? Reese is like, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. Be like, cool, man. You'll be back in three minutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and we also don't run a radio, um, which actually, to be honest, it would be kind of nice to run a radio. But there, it's it's difficult up there. As you know, you need repeaters. Yeah. You know, it doesn't, the, the radios don't travel far enough. You don't need pit speed. Nope. Yeah, we don't need, don't need high beams. They do work, but we don't need <laughs> right. them. <laughs> right. Um, hopefully, you don't need wipers. Yep, but those yeah. we did make that work. So. so, are you actually doing different maps? Or? Yeah, yeah. That, that was that, he had the ability, but we weren't doing too much because we had we had Mitch from M Engineering on the car all the time, um, doing his thing. So, and he worked very closely with Reese to to get it between runs exactly where they wanted. But we weren't, he wasn't changing anything during the run. Huh, okay. It's also incredible to me that the traction control system can handle this power. The traction control is written the way we want it written. Mm. You know, it's, it's just a, it's a map. Mitch was working, again, closely on that. So it's, it, the amount of slip that it allows is tunable. You know, so you know, it starts off with like 16% slip, and I think it went down all the way to 8%, or you just turn it off. You know, and then you have full full control. I just love how clean this stuff is, for, like Porsche. How cool is this? It's, it's pretty just, awesome. It's incredible. Like, look at this. Yeah, and can we talk about how awesome the doors are? <laughs> this is the coolest door I've ever seen. That is, that door probably weighs about ten pounds. I mean, I've okay. I've seen a lot of carbon doors, but the fact is, this is the skin but it's the same as this window frame. Yeah, it's all one piece on the, on the inner skin. It's all one piece, and then if you need to pop the windows out, you can mm -hmm. with these fasteners. Yeah. 
And then the, it's just like little things that make it so cool. You know, you got the, the door pull here, um, the functional door handle. Why would you even need one from this side? Well, I guess in case of emergency, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, or I mean, really for us, you know, for when I sit, you know, a crazy photographer on the, the water tank and go for a drive, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I need to be able to get out. Yeah, but it's funny because initially when I looked at this, I was like, is this is this block off for a speaker? It's actually uh, to be able to access the, yeah, I, the stuff inside the door. Yeah. But it's just so incredible. I cannot believe how light it is. Yeah, this thing barely fits between, you know, the, the the wheel wells in a trailer. So oftentimes we can't get out. We have to have the door off to, to load it into the trailer. Huh. I love the Reese's uh, um, like tape, whatever on on the on the steering wheel. Just to yeah. Kind of and that was that was um, our press release was was fun. It was over at um, we took a photo at his shop, you know, which is in Huntington Beach. Uh, but it was me handing him the steering wheel, you know, because he's never raced a Porsche. Um, and also he needed to modify it because of his hand injury. Oh, he can't okay. he can't it. grip a, a steering wheel and operate the paddles, you know, very easily. So he, you know, fattens it up to, to uh, allow his, his hand to grip it properly. Got it. And then like the brake bias, is that something that's functional still yep. too? Yep, yep, So that's it, because it's a dual master cylinder setup. So it's got a balance bar and it just changes the proportion. Of course, we monitor it electronically as well, but that's, you know, a very mechanical uh, approach to, to adjusting bias. It's incredible. This cockpit is just, it's so busy. Um, I mean, this is what I imagine a Pike Speed car should be. Oh, this is cool. So you left the old tech stickers on here? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think uh, oftentimes you, you don't want to lose the story, you know, of where the car came from, yeah. you know, and, and the heritage of it. Because, you know, especially, you know, you never know when they're gonna be a collector, you know, and when they're a collector, you want the, the, the story. This is so cool. So it raced that it raced at Suzuka, Fuji Speedway, which I've shot at, and Autopolis, which I've shot at too. And I think the last race it did professionally was the 24 Hours of Dubai. How cool is that? That is incredible. It's so easy to see you at the mountain and assume that you guys built an absolute weapon. But it's one thing to actually go through it and kind of just talk through every bit that kind of comes together to create this machine. It, it is really incredible. And of course, you have to have amazing partners to help. Pennzoil jumped on board and they actually came in last minute to help you guys. Yeah, it was honestly a godsend because you know, a lot of this was internally funded by you know our friends and family and a lot of my time it's a ridiculous build i mean really if it was dollar for dollar like paid for this is near a million dollars to get any bit of support from our sponsors like pennzoil it was it was a godsend and it's a great brand on top of that not not just to have them as supporting how did you feel about being able to park next to honestly i think the most famous pennzoil car of all time and one of the most famous Pikes Peak cars of all time. That was something I didn't even know about until we rolled out for FanFest and to park next to, you know, Rod Millen's Pikes Peak Tacoma. It was kind of wild. It was like, shocked me and, it, it, and being as tired as we all are, I did 90 hours a week for six months to build this car. And then you go straight into Pikes Peak where you're waking up at two o'clock in the morning. You know, so everything is kind of a blur. I don't remember a lot of what happened. You know, people are like, hey, remember this? I'm like, no, I don't remember <laughs> saying that or doing that. But to roll into FanFest and be parked next to that and just look at them side by side and go, oh my God. You know, we're, we're in the company of legends. You know, not only the Tacoma, but Rod was there too. Rod and Reese were signing autographs together next to the two cars. Yeah, it was really fun for us because we had a chance to follow Rod and Reese through literally pulling the vehicle out when he pulled it out, not only were there cobwebs on it, not only was it dusty, all the tires were flat. Yeah. Did not hold air. Like everything was apart for whatever reason. There was just things that were in disarray to seeing, I think probably the save of Pike Speak. I don't know if you've seen that video. Yeah. Where he's, just, he's breaking 
the, the tire gets caught on the center paint stripe, I think. Yeah, yeah. And it kicks the rear end out, and he's fully facing the, the spectators, which I had a chance to see the view from the spectators. It was incredible. Yeah. But with that said, super historic. So happy to see it back at the 100th running and so glad that you guys were able to run. It's like a father and son story that was really cool. Unfortunately, it didn't go so well for you guys just because of the weather, but you guys were actually on pace for an incredible run. Yeah, all through practice, if all went well, sub nine minutes, which we would have been the first production-based car to go sub nine minutes. So yeah, race day was a disappointment, but it was for everyone. You know, it, it, no one got any records. No one achieved what they were looking for. We got the class win, which is great, but we really wanted to show what we were capable of. And had we done what we were supposed to, we probably would have had a second place overall, you know, behind Robin. And who knows if anything could happen. You know, the mountain doesn't lie, like yeah. I said. Maybe if it was good, you, you never know. You Mechanical never know. issue, sand on the ground, as, as we've seen. You never Animals. Know. And that's you why know. you can't make claims. Yeah. You can't say what you're going to do. You right. can say what your goal is, right. but really, you never know. Like, it could be, hey, all of a sudden, uh, you forgot to connect your oil tank breather and you catch the back of the fire, car on fire, mm -hmm. which I did, only oh. not on race day. <laughs> right. <laughs> You know, you never really know what's going to happen. So uh, it, it's, it's, that's what's kind of amazing about motorsport in general, but especially Pikes Peak. You know, so you have to cover all the bases. You have to you know, put together a car and work with a driver and have, check all the boxes. So, you know, because then everything that's out of your control, I mean, is out of your control. So anything that is, you must have full control of. For a while, Pikes Peak was known as Mill and Mountain just because they were just so dominant and especially it being a father and son duo. They're racing royalty. Honestly, it's, it's been an honor for me to be able to shoot with both Rod and Reese. And I've been shooting Reese pretty much since he yeah. was competing with drifting. And it's been such an honor to kind of transition to following him doing other things, including recently he drove in a Toyota commercial, which I was a part of, which yeah. was just so ridiculous. Yeah. He was the one who interrupted my shot. Yeah. Like I was setting up <laughs> to take a picture, you know, of, of the Toyota family, and then he just drifts through with a GR Corolla, which was incredible. So how, how has it been for you guys to work with Reese? It's, it's been, a, honestly, a dream come true, because at first it, was, it started with Jeff Zwart, you know, in previous years, and then as a motion engineering, we ran the 935, you know, during COVID in 2020 which was huge for us. But then Reese is in, similarly a legend. He will be in the Hall of Fame someday. That's without a doubt. This was interesting because it all started competing against him, you know, and, and having nothing but respect for him. And then you mentioned the, 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 the Tacoma being in pieces. Uh, he and I actually worked together in 2017 because he did a post of the Genesis. And he said, dusting off this old girl. And fun fact, she won Formula Drift, she redlined Time Attack, and holds the record at Pikes Peak, which got me in the ribs because with Jeff's old Turbo Cup car, we missed that record by two tenths of a second. So I commented and said, hey, Reese, you know, don't rub it in, champ, or whatever. And he goes, Joey, contact me. I, I need your help. A w like a few days later, Reese called me and he said, hey, that Genesis is great, but it just never has handled well. Will you help? So I re-engineered that car and he got another win in it. Didn't, you know, no records or anything, but that was in 2017. Fast forward to this, it's been a dream because like I said before, he and I have the same approach to Pikes Peak and never have I had so much fun with a driver because he's not just a driver. He builds cars, he builds trucks, you know that. And he has a very, very methodical approach to his builds. It's all very scientific. You could watch him during the test, like randomly, because we have no radio, he would all of a sudden slow the car down. And they're like, oh, what's wrong with it? I go, no, Reese is doing his thing. And then just load it up with no air going over the car, you know, to really test the thermal capability of the oil system and the cooling system. You know, and then to chassis tuning as well, like to, he's never driven a 911, you know, so I wanted to make him comfortable and slowly, you know, get him up to understanding the cars. And by the time he did, I knew he did. And he was like, hey, what do you think about doing this to the, the car? And I was like, that's exactly where I'm going with it. You know, so we, we just started driving and having a lot of fun. It's also really amazing because it's somebody you can trust. 
to put your heart and soul into a build you know, of something that's worth not only the dollar amount, but also everything I've ever worked toward, you know, to put a driver in there and not worry about them making a mistake. I never once thought about him losing it or you know, putting it into the side of the hill or off the side of the hill. I just knew he was gonna do what it took to get up the hill safely and continue to make it quicker and quicker and quicker, so. Yeah, including think, bringing it back through the worst fog that we've ever seen up there. And you mentioned the, the, the sad thing of like, had it been dry you know, on race day, like anything could have happened. Reese was very sick on race day. And that would have been heartbreaking had it been dry and perfect and he wasn't able to perform. That would have been heartbreaking for both of us. I mean, he had a bad fever and actually tested positive for COVID later that day on race day. So it was <laughs> kind of everything came all at once and it was like, man. But you know, that's, that's how it goes. That's the way the mountain works. It's the way racing works. You really never know what to expect. I hope you guys enjoyed this series. This is something that we haven't done yet. Comment below if you enjoyed this series. It's just kind of a fun way to feature someone else's work. Um, but at the same time, we really just wanted to kind of highlight the build and showcase what Joey and the team did. Um, I think the last thing we need to do is maybe here at start and maybe pull it around the block to kind of see it run a little bit on the streets. Yeah, what we do you can, think? We can give it a try. All right. Let's see how it goes. Let's, let's try it. <laughs> oh, dude, this is sick. <laughs> There's just something awesome about street driving a race car. I don't know how I talked you into this. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> You just saw a ghost. <laughs> I mean, the, the uh, I, I, I keep experiencing these things with you. You know, like uh, it, part of it is because you're a madman, and then the fact that you're all right with driving a million-dollar race car on the street, uh, all in good fun. You know. You know what? That was. I, I didn't even get to half throttle. Yeah. I, I, mean, I believe that. And imagine full throttle, but also making grip. Like that, it just, it's still, to see Reese's reactions when he got out after the first tests, like some of them were hysterical. Cause he was just like, 
oh my God, we have a race car, you know? And then uh, you saw us at practice, you know, and he was just having a, the time of his life. There's nothing more rewarding. Has Reese said anything about this being potentially the fastest car that he's driven up bikes? I don't think anybody would ever really say it just like that, but to say, you know, one of the fastest cars that he's driven was the Bentley. Yeah. And in practice, like our first test at Willow, he's like, this matches the Bentley, if not beats it. Mm. You know, and he said that out of the gate. So he said stuff like that a few times, but it's hard to compare apples well, to what, apples. What but. about when we want to compare it apples to apples? Yeah. Like what about qualifying times versus the Bentley? Uh, I believe the Bentley outqualified us. Okay. Yeah, but when it came to the midsection of the mountain, uh, it, it, we were we were quicker than the Bentley. We did over overlay videos, uh -huh. like we would seriously start videos and watch them on our phones side by side, and we, you could see the turn in points. And we were actually at uh, you know over a second quicker than the Bentley in the middle, which was pretty awesome. That was a new experience. <laughs> First of all, sitting on a water tank. <laughs> um, it's it's just the sound. There's nothing else. I've I've ridden in so many cars. I've driven so many cars. There's nothing. I've never experienced anything it's, like that it's, ever. It's scary. It just just the sound alone is enough to make you think chaos is happening. Yeah. Well, like you it, can't. It doesn't help that there's like a, a winter weather warning. I don't know, or it's like a <laughs> severe weather warning going on. Is that when it's like too low, or when the clutch disengages, or what? What is that sound that's Which, coming? What it, it has. You don't even hear it. I mean, you hear you hear the clutch it's engaging. Like it's like. Meh. Oh no no that's the that's the pump for the paddle shift because oh. it's it's pneumatic uh, air shifters on the paddle that shifts uh, the the pneumatic rams on the transmission itself. So they're right by your left butt cheek was was the pump. Right, but but so it would go. It would oh. pump back up, and then I'd pull a gear, and it would go. Yeah, it, it is. Like There's <laughs> just so many crazy noises because it's the hard shifting, like really something exploding, like it, really hard, hard metal on metal action. It's, and then it's the turbo spooling up, the noise of that, the transmission whining. Straight cut gears, you know, make a ton of on solid mounts, you know, solid engine and transmission mounts. So that's just going through the car. Then the hard shift is because there's a shift cut you know, cause I'm not oh. lifting and I'm not clutching. Oh. It just goes bang. And then also because it, it cuts, it cuts ignition timing for a second, there's an explosion in the exhaust too. Once it re reinstates, it goes boom. And every shift there's a huge pop. And that's, that's just from shift cut. So there's just, there's a lot of, lot of different sounds happening that are just shocking without Th a helmet that's on. That's gotta be the craziest car you've ever driven on the street. Oh, by far, by far. Especially with no seat belts and you sitting on a water tank. <laughs> We just, I just, <laughs> makes you feel like I, a kid I, again, when, doesn't when it? When I thought about this, like I first texted Joey and I was like, hey, can I ride in it? And he's like, sure, but there's no seat. I'm like, and the answer is, <laughs> you know, of course you can. You know, when, when I was a kid and, and just before my pro racing days, I was club racing and, and I was up in Seattle and they had a, um, a, a GT3R, a 996 GT3R, uh, RS, sorry. So right before the RSR. And we won the race and it was a female driver, Kim Hiskey. She, uh, she's like, you wanna go for the parade lap? And I'm like, where? And she had me sit on the cool suit box, which was nothing more than like an igloo box. And I held onto the cage and she really didn't hold up. Like she, <laughs> she, I was hanging on for dear life, which you know made me think of that. So I'm like, if she was willing to do it with me on track, I can do it on our back road here. That's amazing. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for having us. And yeah. thanks for having us be a part of the series. It's. Uh, really cool because you know we get to see what you guys do from the outside from our lens and from our team but to see the perspective from a completely different team is incredible yeah yeah, yeah. thanks for coming thanks for sharing you know it's it's fun to see how many different points of connection we all have. You've worked with Reese in, in commercials and we've worked with you in different areas, but you know, Pikes Peak is one that pulls us all together and it becomes a very, very small family, an international family too, so yeah. uh, we're happy to have you here. Amazing, can't wait to see you guys there next year. And of course, thanks to Penn's Oil as always for supporting cool content like this. See you guys in the next episode. Hey, thanks for watching. If you want to support us directly, go to LarryChenPrints.com. I print and sign every single one of these. This is the perfect gift or it's the perfect piece of art for your wall.